I'm Mark Familio. I'm the chairman of the Sarasota Film Festival. and Welcome to the luncheon here at the Sarasota Yacht Club in honor of uh, Rory Kennedy. <clears throat> and I'm also going to mention her four-time Emmy-nominated writer husband, Mark Bailey. He's a great surfer as well. I want to thank some of our major sponsors. Boar's Head, I don't know if Kelly's here. Is Kelly Martella here? She may not be, but Boar's Head, uh, Wanda Ryle, Alan Wallach, Sharon Weiner, uh, Scene Magazine, uh, who's here today with us, and I know they've been photographing anything that moves, and uh, WSNN as well. Um, I'd like to... <clears throat> I'd like to introduce Grant uh, Boxleiter, who's the news anchor for WSNN. And uh, where are you, Grant? It's good to see you. Thanks very much, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for being here. It's an honor to join you today for lunch and conversation with Rory Kennedy. It's going to be a great talk, and I'm sure you're all going to enjoy it. Through more than 30 documentaries that she's done, she's given voice to people we should know as well as covering the significant issues of the day in a really thoughtful way. And we can't wait to see tonight's big film, The Opening Night, Take Every Wave, The Life of Laird Hamilton. You saw the surfboard out there, that's gonna be fantastic. Just wanna mention, SNN has been associated with the film festival for many years, and it's just one of those magical events on the Sun Coast that truly makes this just another day in paradise, right everybody? That's fantastic. SNN is your local around-the-clock place for local news, local weather, and local sports. I'm on live weeknights, 5, 6, 10, 11. I want you all to tune in for that when you can. I want to thank everybody for supporting the Sarasota Film Festival and go out and see lots of movies. It's going to be great. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, SNN. We rely on you for our news. Our, even our, well, no, our real news. T today we're beyond proud to be honoring Rory Kennedy. This is her third time with us at the Sarasota Film Festival. I think her husband Mark's been here a couple times too, right? Two or three? Three? <laughs> I noticed, I noticed. Uh, <clears throat> her first time was in 2012 with her film Ethel about her mom, and I know we all love that. It won the Audience Award for Best Documentary. We liked the film so much that in 2014, her film Last Days in Vietnam opened the festival at the Van Wezel here in Sarasota. When we found out Rory had a new film, we reached out immediately. It played at Sundance to wide acclaim, and I am so fortunate and so happy that she agreed to bring it here. Uh, I th think she's a friend. I'd say she's a bud, right? And her husband as well, even though I ribbed the hell out of him. And I'm going to pass it on immediately to the montage and move right along here. So let's take a look at our montage. 
Why should I have to uh, answer the, all these questions? Uh, well, we're making a documentary about you. What <laughs> you need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. My father, Robert F. Kennedy, died on June 6, 1968 more than 40 years ago. I'm Rory, his last and 11th child. Because I was born six months after my father's death, I never had a chance to know him. I was raised by my mother, Ethel Kennedy. August 1942, a young woman boards a train in Vienna, bound for Munich a city celebrating one Nazi victory after another. She carries a suitcase, a book of poetry, and nothing else. Her papers say she is 20-year-old Greta Denner, a full-blooded Aryan who can travel freely in the Reich. But she is not who she says she is. Sewn into the spine of the book are her true identity papers. She is, in fact, Edith Hahn, a Jewish fugitive wanted by the Gestapo. I'm running for mayor, and the reason why I'm running, three reasons real quick. For the last 32 years of your life, you've had the same leadership. We ain't going nowhere. And we don't need no carpetbaggers coming here telling us how bad we are. Stay out. You're in the city. You have to be very careful. You know, if you if you take on sharp chains. That place turned me into a monster. I was very angry. You know, it's being Abu Ghraib. You know, it changed your whole mind frame. You know, you can go from being a docile, you know, you know, jolly guy, and you go to Abu Ghraib for a few for a few. You know, it's being Iraq for for a while. You know, you become, you know, a robot. We today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam. We have adopted a plan for the complete withdrawal of all U.S. combat ground forces. We are finally bringing American men home. The Battle of Saigon has begun. That morning, there must have been at least 10,000 people ringing the embassy. There was a sea of people wanting to get out. They looked up at the helicopters leaving, and I could see their eyes, desperate eyes. There are no words to describe what a ship looks like. It holds 200, and it's got 2,000 on it. We have no more helicopters, that's it. As it took off, I could see the group right where we had left them. It was just so serious and deep a betrayal. Good afternoon. My name, of course, is Carol Buchanan, and I am a past president of the U.S. National Committee for UN Women. Our organization works to end violence against women and to generate awareness and financial support for UN women's programs aimed at gender equity and the, equality and the empowerment of women. The U.S. National Committee and its Through the Eyes International Film Festival have partnered with the Sarasota Film Festival for eight years. And in collaboration with SFF, 
we have given the Impact Award to women who have worked to make a difference in the lives of women through their work in the field and through the arts. Rory Kennedy, this year's recipient, is one of America's most prolific filmmakers, documentary filmmakers. In addition to her work in films, Ms. Kennedy is a social activist, a wife, and a mother. An Academy Award nominated prime time Emmy Award winning director, producer, Ms. Kennedy's work deals with some of the world's most pressing issues. Poverty, political corruption, domestic abuse, drug addiction, human rights, and mental illness. Kennedy has made more than 30 highly acclaimed documentaries. Her films have appeared in HBO, PBS, Lifetime Television, A&E, Court TV, LTLC, and Oxygen Network. Most recently, Kennedy completed Take Every Wave, a feature documentary about the life of legendary big wave surfer Laird Hamilton, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2017 and will be, of course, opening the opening night film uh, tonight for the Sarasota Film Festival. In 2014, Kennedy made the Academy Award nominated Last Days in Vietnam, and we saw excerpts from most of these, which was the opening night film for that Sarasota Film Festival and went on to uh, into wide theatrical release in the fall of that year. At the 2012 Sundance Film Festival, she premiered Ethel, a feature-length docu documentary chronicling the extraordinary life of her mother, Ethel Kennedy, wife of Robert F. Kennedy, which was also screened here at SFF. The film was nominated for five Primetime Emmy Awards. In 2011, Kennedy produced Killing in the Name, which earned an Academy Award nomination for Best Documentary Short. In 2009, she executed, she executive produced Street Fight, which earned an Academy Award nomination for Best Documentary Feature. In 2007, her film, Ghosts of Abu Sharib, I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. Sharib. Okay. Premiered at Sundance <laughs> and went on to win a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Nonfiction Special. Her other projects include Bobby Fischer Against the World in 2011, Shouting Fire Stories from the Edge of Free Speech. 2009, and The Fence in 2010. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times. And she's appeared on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, The Today Show, CNN, and NPR. Kennedy is a governor of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences, a graduate of Brown University, she majored in women's studies. Along with acclaimed documentary filmmaker Liz Garbus, she is co-founder of Moxie Firecracker Film in New York and Los Angeles. A committed activist, Kennedy continues to fight for social justice and human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present Rory Kennedy. It's like a sky vodka bottle that's been <laughs> left in the sun too long. Yeah, right. <laughs> Has a cork on it. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> hi, hi, everybody. I'm Michael Dunaway. I'm the creative producer of the um, Sarasota Film Festival. Seattle. I don't know why I almost said Seattle. Thank you. 
Uh, it's great, great to be back, uh, and great to be welcoming back uh, Rory Kennedy to our uh, to our stage here. Um, this is getting to be a habit. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Um, so I wanted to briefly, we'll have time tonight to talk about Take Every Wave uh, at the screening, but I wanted to briefly go over some of the other films in your storied, already storied career. Um, and I wanted to start out with, um, with American Hollow in 1999. Um, for, for a casual onlooker, it might appear to be an unlikely place for you with your background to start out. Uh, about a, uh, with a film about an obscure, poor Appalachian family. Uh, but uh, knowing about your admiration for uh, Barbara Koppel, who is here tonight, uh, to today, I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd love for you to explain why it's actually not, not an accident at all. <laughs> okay. Um, well, that's great. I first just wanted to um, thank Carol, and it, it's such a, a huge honor to receive this award from the UN. Um, I'm a huge fan of the work that the UN is doing, particularly around women's rights, and um, I was a, a women's studies major at, in college, and these issues have been important to me my entire life. In fact, it's really the reason I started to get into filmmaking in the first place. I had never taken a film class um, in college, but I was really interested in what I could do to forward the cause of women's issues and for those who had been marginalized. And, and I felt at that time, as media was kind of bursting, that doing it through storytelling was really the best way to help people understand these issues, often very complex issues, from the perspective of the people who were experiencing it. So the very first film I made was actually an extension of a paper I had done at Brown, my kind of final thesis paper, which was about women and substance abuse and the difficulties that women had trying to get drug and alcohol treatment, particularly w pregnant women and women with children. And, um, and I felt that I, I, when I was doing the research, I had met a number of women who were struggling with these issues. And at, in the media at the time, some of you might recall that there was a, a lot of uh, stories about crack mothers having crack babies, and they were sending them to prison. And what I was finding when I was talking to the women is that they had tried to get treatment and they had been denied care because the programs didn't want to take the, the added vulnerability of being sued because they had a pregnant woman and something happens. And that part of the story wasn't being told and I was meeting these women and I thought this is in such contrast to what I was reading in the press and they need to be able to tell their stories and go to Capitol Hill and tell the legislators not to throw them in jail, but to get them treatment. And so I decided, well, I can't get them all to go to Capitol Hill, but I can bring a camera into these, their homes and help them tell their stories. So that was my first film, which was Women of Substance. And you know, I really love the process of telling that story and bringing that film to Capitol Hill and seeing the difference that it could make. And, and from there, I went on to make American Hollow. Um, mm -hmm. But I do want to say that, you know, just to, to again recognize Carol and the work that the, that the UN is doing, how important it is, especially now in our country, to support organizations like the UN and the, the work that women are doing in every capacity, whether that's women running for legislative office or working in the nonprofit field or making films, you know, the great Barbara Koppel who is here, all of these efforts contribute to a better world for, for women and for all of us. So thank you again for that recognition. I'm really grateful to you. Okay, now I'm gonna answer your question. Um, so I, I, I will say, in fact, that, that Barbara Koppel, um, who is here and really is one of the, the greatest filmmakers ever, um, really amazing. She's won multiple Academy Awards and she makes incredible stories and is such a supporter of women and filmmakers and you, you know, she'll, she's always behind you supporting everything that we do and she's really an extraordinary person and she actually really inspired me 
to make American Hollow. She had made a, a great documentary called Harlan County, USA, which many of you might have heard of, and, and numerous other films. And, um, and my, I think also because my father had spent some time in Appalachia in the, in the 1960s, and that experience had really had a profound impact on him. I was interested in making a film about Appalachia. I came across this family. Um, there were, there were, uh, it was a couple who had 13 children. Um, there were 11 children in my family, so I think I <coughs> identified with them to some degree as well. But, um, but they lived up in the hills of, of eastern Kentucky, and they um, lived in a very kind of isolated part of the country. They, uh, they lived off the land. They had outhouses. Many of them didn't have running water or electricity in their homes. And um, to understand kind of the challenges that they faced, there was, uh, and, and you know, again, I think I always have somewhat of a lens towards women in my films and understanding the challenge that I read, the matriarch faced, but also there was a lot of domestic violence that had occurred throughout multiple generations of this family and seeing how that played itself out was a, big storyline and a significant storyline in our film. Um, and it was, it was a really wonderful experience for me. I went out in the field with um, my, my director of photography. It was just the two of us. I did the sound. And we lived with this family on and off for a year. Um, and it was, uh, and, and you know, then Mark and I were in the edit room together. He, he wrote that film with, with me and played a huge role. And you know, it's, it's, and now we've been doing this for the last 20 years of, of working together in, in the edit room. He doesn't really come into the field so much, but um, he leaves that, that to me. But he, uh, he, you know, it's a great dynamic because the, uh, you get really attached to certain things when you're, having a relationship with people and you know something happens and you think I've got to include that in the film and he he has a little bit more distance so he's like no forget it you know we need to focus on this storyline and um and it's a great writer so anyway that was a wonderful experience it was my first feature film it premiered at Sundance and it went on to have a theatrical release and um and it was fantastic Oh, and my sister-in-law wanted me to ask you how we can get a hold of that movie. I don't think it's streaming anywhere, right? Yeah, you know, you know that was, I mean, I'll try to be brief about it, but that was complicated because we had the, because it's because of the music rights mm. on that film. We had a, it, we only had the music rights for 10 years or something. And so when they expired, they couldn't renew, they couldn't renew the release of the film. Gotcha. So, uh, and the music was expensive, so that complicated it. But tell her to email me. Okay. <laughs> I, know, I know somebody who knows how to get it. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and then in 2003, Pandemic Facing AIDS, which you, you've talked a, a little bit about, but um, I, I, I want you, wanted you also to talk about the outreach program that you designed for that, because I think too many times documentarians will make a film about something that gets me all riled up about the issue and then I'd find that I don't know where to focus that. Yeah, yeah, well that was important to me and that was a big reason, as I said, why I started getting involved in filmmaking mm -hmm. is because I felt like it could really have an impact. Mm -hmm. And so um, pandemic was certainly that experience. I had, I had been asked to join a White House delegation under the Clinton administration who was going to Africa and I had been asked to join that delegation, make a short film about women and AIDS and children, women and children who were struggling with AIDS in Africa and this was back in like 1998. And so I went on this trip again with the same DP that who I had made American Hollow with, and it was just the two of us, and we made this film. And you know, I, I remember um, meeting a woman there. We went to this village. It was in Uganda, and we went to a village, and there was a woman there who had uh, twelve children, eleven of whom had died of AIDS, mm. and mm. she had thirty-five grandchildren, and they all lived in the same hut together. Many of them had AIDS, and um, and you know I remember thinking that the the people who had organized this delegation must have 
tried to find the most extreme family in all of Africa, you know, to sort of jolt us into understanding the, the degree to which this, 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 that AIDS had impacted people. And I decided with the, my DP to stay in this little village and everybody else moved on because I wanted to spend some time filming this grandmother. And it turned out down the street from her there was another grandmother with nine children, seven of whom had died of AIDS, and another grandmother with a very similar story. And, you know, you really appreciated how much this disease had, had devastated communities, annihilated villages. I mean, you know, it was so extreme. And I remember heading into this journey and this trip thinking, you know, I'd read the statistics and the numbers, and then I got there, and it was, you know, and you see the human cost of it. Mm. And on such a direct level, and it's so profound and upsetting. And when we were, so we went on to make that film, which we showed on Capitol Hill, and I had an opportunity to show it exclusively to 50 senators. Wow. And as a result of that, they, um, they, they changed their policy. There, had, there was virtually no money going to Africa and AIDS at that time. They increased the budget, you know, hundredfold, and there was really a realization of what was happening on the ground, and you could really feel the impact that the film had in helping people to understand that. But when I was coming home from that, and you know, having learned then that the the, the impact AIDS it had in Africa and how it was starting to reach places like Eastern Europe and South America and and other places around the globe that I really felt like it was much more strategic and, and obviously much more humane to prevent this disease from getting to the, to the place that it had gotten in Africa. So I went on to propose making a five-part series about the global AIDS pandemic, mm -hmm. which was called Pandemic, and I got support from the Gates Foundation and from HBO. And we went on to make that film, and because we wanted to have impact, we also did a website in five different languages. We gave people opportunities to make donations and to learn more on these websites. Um, we also did a photography exhibition which premiered at, at the Barcelona AIDS Conference and President Clinton came and introduced it. Um, and so we, and we, we did a photography book along with it as well and um, we really, you know, push to drive people to, to, to and, and we did screenings on Capitol Hill and to legislators and policymakers in an effort to really try to change policies and, you know, increase the support for, for people with AIDS. Those of you who have been coming to the festival for a couple of years know that I always say that art changes things, and a lot of times that is indirect and implicit, but this is a great example of a way that directly and explicitly you made a piece of art that changed things, and that's really beautiful. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Um, yes, please. Um, uh, I'm going to go off script a little bit to talk about Ghosts of Abu Ghraib in 2007 because I just rewatched that last night. I think it was my second time seeing it. And just seeing the little bit in the, in the reel there made me think that what I really want to ask you about that movie is um, how being shooting it and then being in the edit room for that whole time, I, I can't imagine the emotional toll that must have taken to be in that very, very dark space for so long, at least with pandemic facing AIDS, there were parts of it that were sort of functional and logistical and philosophical, but it seems like Ghosts of Abu Ghraib, you were, no, you were just in the, in the gunk the whole time. How, tell me about how you, how you dealt with that as a, just as a person. Yeah, well, it was, it was very difficult. And, you know, with that film, we interviewed um, an, uh, primarily the people who had been on the ground, who had been at Abu Ghraib, who had committed the torture. <coughs> and then we also um, interviewed a number of the detainees who had been tortured. Um, and then we also interviewed a number of the uh, people who had put the policy into place. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a tough one. Uh, there, was no, there was no way around that. And um, living with those images, and processing that and kind of, um, you know, this, this the, the, the human nature 
that enables that level of abuse to take place is, you know, is a deeply upsetting concept. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of what, what the, the conditions are that, that create that. But at the same time, we felt like we were telling a really important story that hadn't mm -hmm. been told yeah. in that kind of way um, at that point. And to be able to put all the pieces together, to be able to see it in one place, and to really understand um, what we had done as a nation, what our contribution to that was, what our legislators and policymakers, their contribution, and what it takes to get people to do something like that, mm -hmm. which frankly isn't that much, yeah. um, you know, is something that I think we collectively felt, those of us who were working in the edit room, the editor and Mark and I primarily, that you know, you're, you're telling a story that is relevant mm -hmm. and that can have impact and can make a difference. And you know, you might not be able to sleep at night, you might have bad dreams, and you know, you, you might just struggle psychologically with it. And that's part of the process of making these films is that they challenge us. You know, they're not easy. There's never, and Barbara, I'm sure, would agree, there's never a film that's easy, you know, and, um, and they affect us in a, on a very personal level, but it's also why we keep doing it because we keep learning and we keep evolving and we keep being challenged, which is the beauty of it as well, you know. Um, and I would just say, you know, we're, we're unfortunately in this country at the highest echelons of government revisiting these discussions and, you know, our, we have a president who is advocating that we torture people again. And so, you know, unfortunately the film continues to be relevant and so I would encourage them and all of us to see this and understand what the implications are and what the meaning is of it and um, and you know it's unfortunate that given that I th thought we came out of that with some pretty clear lessons of what not to do and, and you know here we are yet again considering it as an option to waterboard and to torture and um, that is deeply upsetting to me. Yeah absolutely. Uh, it's another example, though, at the time at least, it's another example of, I, th I think yours and, and Alex's movie came out the same year, right? Taxi to the Dark Side, yes. that the same year? Yes. And those two movies, you two really moved the needle on public opinion. And uh, yeah, maybe we need to uh, be sponsoring some uh, double features all around the country this year as that yeah, And Errol Morris again. had a film that year too. And, you know, with all of these films, with AIDS, with poverty, with women's issues, you know, I think in, in our field, we recognize the importance to have different perspectives addressing similar topics because they, they require so much of our attention and they're, er, they deserve it and they, they've earned that, unfortunately, you know, for, for better or for worse. Speaking of films you've made that are now very relevant again, uh, The Fence in 2010. Um, I love I love that it was a serious but also lighthearted look at the um, at the issue, and uh, I, I, I love little touches of humor in otherwise serious things. And uh, I told you earlier the sign. My favorite shot in that whole thing is the sign that says, uh, "Do not hit golf balls into Mexico." I just I just think that's hilarious. A range that's right there near the near the border. How, how did you do? You remember finding finding that sign? I do, I do. I mean, the relevance of that sign is, you know, one of the challenges of the fence is that it's a lot, of, it's, you know, it's on a 2,000 mile border on our southern border with Mexico. And a lot of that border is, uh, is defined by the Rio Grande ri River, which is, as you can imagine, quite windy. It's, it's like an S the entire Rio Grande River is, is sort of in an S shape all along, so it's got a lot of wiggles and jiggles. And so, you know, then when they were originally building the fence, 
they had to decide were they going to follow the river, Rio Grande River, which would cost them, you know, 50 times more because they would have to follow this S shape, or just go north of the Rio Grande River and have the fence be straight. So they opted for the latter, but what that meant is that there is property which is south of the Rio Grande River, but in the United States. I mean, I'm sorry, south of the fence north of the Rio Grande River and in the United States. So there's this kind of weird zone and there's property like this golf course in that zone. <laughs> so the, this golf course is on either side of the fence and they have to go through the fence to get to certain sides of the golf course and then they're, you know, 10 feet away from Mexico. <laughs> And so it just sort of spoke to the absurdity of it. I mean, I'll tell you, the film opens with, uh, we, we in, in, interview this Minuteman who had been very supportive of having the fence built. And so I said to him, well, you know, can Mexico, do people from Mexico in the South, do they, are they able to get through this fence? You know, and there's the fence and it's like the, as high as this wall in certain places where we were it was. And he said, well, yeah, you know, they'll put a ladder up and they'll, they'll climb over it or they'll, they'll just, you know, put a tunnel underneath it. And he said, or frankly, you know, they'll just go like a mile down the road and the fence ends and they just walk around it. And then the camera pans and the fence just ends. I mean, it's absurd. The fence go, it goes and then it stops and then it goes and it stops. And, and so, you know, there's really not a lot of logic to... I mean, there are many reasons why the fence is absurd, but those are some of them. <laughs> um, I want to make sure and leave time for audience questions because I know there are plenty. So for the moment, I'm going to skip over Ethel and Last Days of Vietnam, even though you know Ethel's my favorite of yours. Uh, uh, but we've had a chance to talk about those, um, and, and you've had a chance to talk about them to Sarasota audiences. They can ask about them, too. I did want to ask one last question. Um, and at, as when we've talked before, I, I, I always try to be careful to interview as a filmmaker and not as a Kennedy, right? But uh, there, there is something that, I, as I was going through your whole filmography, I wanted to point out which is that when you look at American Hollow and its care for the forgotten people, the overlooked people, the common man, and when you look at pandemic fighting AIDS and its compassion for the suffering, when you look at Ghosts of Abu Ghraib and its concern with human rights and our responsibility to live up to American ideals, when you look at the fence and its idea of opening up the American dream, when you look at Ethel and Last Days of Vietnam and it's dealing with issues that your family was directly you know, involved in, um, I think in retrospect it looks like exactly the type of filmography that the daughter of these two extraordinary people would produce. And so, yeah, yeah absolutely. And so I'm curious if you if that was intentional or accidental, if you at the beginning of your career sort of had in your mind, I have a responsibility to my family legacy to make films that have to do with this, or if you at some point looked back and went, huh, that's, it, that does kind of all fit in and make it of a piece. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, I don't, yeah, yes, it does. And, um, and I've certainly been asked that question over the course of my life. You know, I... I grew up in an environment where I looked at the people around me who were committing themselves to helping other people and trying to make the world a better place. And um, I, th you know, it, I, I, there was never a moment where somebody in my family said, you know, you have to give back. That was never my experience, or you need to dedicate your life to public service, but. We grew up and th we were surrounded by the most extraordinary examples of people who were committing themselves to that and it was an ideal that, you know, s that uh, somehow, you know, penetrated and I think um, became part of my consciousness and uh, was, it was, you know, and I think that one of the great gifts that my family gave me is is that 
sense of, of the importance of giving back insofar as it's such a rewarding path, mm -hmm. you know, and it's such a purposeful path in life. And to be able to have that and that sense of, of drive um, that I think, you know, almost everybody in my family has is a gift, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it was, it's never been experienced for me as any type of sense of burden or obligation or responsibility. It's, it's um, you know, when you're surrounded by people like Nelson Mandela and, <laughs> and see what he, how he's committed his life and, and what he did, you know, we went on a family trip last June, we went to Robbins Island with uh, the cellmate of Nelson Mandela who just passed away. Um, and it was an extraordinary thing, you know, where, where you uh, understand and appreciate Nelson Mandela choosing to stay in prison mm -hmm. because of living up, wanting to live, have his country live up to greater ideals and being unwilling to let him to, to, even though there was an opportunity for him to leave, but it would mean that the apartheid system would stay in place. And he refused and chose to stay in this prison. You know, wh that, that sense of, um, I mean, it's an, it's an extraordinary thing to be around people like that. And, mm -hmm. and um, so I'm eternally grateful to, mm -hmm. to that gift, mm -hmm. for that gift. Amen. Amen. Okay, I think we do not have a third microphone to go around for audience questions. So if, if we have questions, I'll call on you. You can stand and ask it, and I'll repeat it so everyone else can hear it. Who would like to uh, ask Ms. Kennedy a question? Nobody ever wants to be first. Oh, we do have a third mic. Wonderful. Is there a staff member that can run the third mic around to the questioners? Awesome. Thanks, brother. I think Lady in Red right here has a question. Thank you. Uh, this is a very personal question, but you, I know that you are the 11th, the baby of your family, and it would be very interesting if you would make a film about how you were brought up by your, with your brothers and sisters. And that's always of interest. We love human interest stories, but the effect that they had on you and how they helped raise you, because it is very hard to be the baby and especially under the circumstances that you had. And with Nelson Mandela, I was in South Africa a couple years ago, and the one thing that I came back with is how everyone that I met in that country, men included, would just tear up when they talk about Nelson Mandela. They just absolutely love him. And your family has done this, I think, for many of us in the United States. We admire your father and your whole family so much, but it would be a really interesting story to hear about you. I don't know if you have time to talk about that today. Thank It'd you. It'd be a way to get back at all your brothers and sisters, well, too. I, I think I did make that film, and I called it Ethel, but um, I, you know, uh, I feel like I had a really extraordinary childhood in many ways, and I um, love my brothers and sisters, and my mother and, you know, it was uh, a, a, a really beautiful um, experience in so many ways. And, you know, I was just with my mother last week and she really, she really wanted to come here. Um, and Mark was very generous in helping her get here, but she had some more family that was trickling in today. So she was sorry to miss this experience, but she does say hi to all of you. Um, but, you know, my mother, and siblings had a had such a significant influence on me. Um, I'll tell you one uh, little anecdote, uh, anecdote about her that um, that was that it might be somewhat revealing of our whole family situation. But <laughs> because there were so many of us, we there was a, a rule when we grew up that whoever was in the TV room first got to control the clicker, right? And who, but. But if somebody came in later and wanted to watch the news, that trumped who was, whoever had the clicker. And so we would always come in and then want to irritate our siblings, and so we'd say we wanted to watch the news, right? And, then, <laughs> and so we would watch the news a lot when we were growing up. And, 
at this particular time, I was like 13 years old, and there was a lot of coverage about what was going on in South Africa, just to bring it back, um, with the apartheid movement. And there were a number of people then being arrested in Washington, D.C. to protest apartheid. And so my brother Douglas and I one night were watching the news and we kind of looked at each other and thought, well, you know, maybe we should get arrested. And so then we, we talked about that for a little bit and then we were like, okay, well, which one of us is going to tell our mother that we want to get arrested? And so Douglas said, well, she likes you better, so you should tell her. And I said, no, she <laughs> likes you better. So anyway, we decided to the next morning we would go and tell her together at breakfast and so we went in to breakfast and we were a little anxious and a little nervous about how she was going to respond and we made this whole speech about South Africa and apartheid and how we needed to stand up for them and that we wanted to get arrested and she said great I will drive you down there we're going to go there this afternoon and she threw us in her car and we went to straight down the South African embassy and you know got in walked across the line and promptly got arrested and I had they handcuffed me and I had my hands behind my back and I looked up and there was my mother and she's never been prouder. I mean, she was <laughs> looking at me like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. You know, so that's the environment I grew up in. <laughs> Please tell me there's a copy of that mug shot somewhere. <laughs> I think there probably is. What other questions do we have? Thank you. Rory, you were talking about, I think it was your first documentary, Woman of Substance. And I know your cousin Patrick uh, and I think Chris Lawford are both very much into the fight of getting parity for treatment for addicts and people that suffer from brain disorders and mental illness, and I wonder if you might have a comment about that. Um, well, yes, and, and uh, that is a, a big focus, and, um, and you know, my nephew Joe, with this new healthcare law that had been proposed over the last couple of weeks, um, there was, they were stripping all support for mental health all support for mental health in the new health care law. And, um, and my nephew Joe, and I would encourage you all to watch it if you haven't seen it, was very well-spoken and confrontational with his uh, Republican colleagues about what the implications of this was going to be. Um, you know, I think there, it's, it's very hard to come across a family who doesn't have some story of some family member who struggles with mental health issues in this country. And, you know, I think it's, uh, it's an enormous issue and people really suffer. And I think that um, as, as society, as a government, um, as a culture, that we really need to, you know, show the level of compassion and understanding with, uh, for people who struggle with these issues. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's certainly a commitment that um, a number of family members, as, as you've recognized, have made their absolute priority. I think all of us in, in my family believe that it's um, an issue that deserves, including my Uncle Teddy, who, you know, really had committed a lot of his efforts to creating parity as well for people with mental illness. Um, but that, you know, I think we all feel very passionate about the issue and, and, and feel that as a country right now, we're not doing enough and we need to do more. Um, and, you know, let alone, you know, it, the, the rollbacks that we're now being threatened with. And, and that is one of many issues that, that we're facing right now as a nation to, you know, and the more people who can articulate that and argue for it, the better, right? So. Yes. I think we have time for one more. Hi, Rory. Hello. How are you? Um, I wonder um, if you've chosen the topic of your next film and also how you decide what you do next and what, you know, kind of inspires you to focus on one topic or another. And when you were talking about watching the news with your family, I wonder if you feel that, you know, the sort of endangerment of the freedom of the press that I think is encroaching our 
government and our society right now is a topic you've thought about covering? Right. Um, so we're, uh, Mark and I are doing, uh, the question was about our, uh, you know, how we choose our topics, and that can be a range of experiences. Um, you know, sometimes like the example of the AIDS film, I had done a smaller film, but then kind of got ignited to be more passionate about a particular issue because of that experience. Sometimes a broadcaster or financier will come to us and say, we're interested in you doing this kind of film, and if we're interested in the subject, that um, is often a nice way to go about it because it usually has financing and distribution, which is um, a, always a challenge in making documentaries. Um, and then sometimes, you know, we'll just read or come across a story or have access to um, some special way into a story that we feel like is kind of deserving and uh, lends itself to an important or timely or great story uh, that should be made into a documentary. Um, in terms of what we're working on now, we're just finishing a documentary about the digital divide, looking at kids in the public schools in this country who don't have access to computers and the internet and the impact that that has on their education and their ability to stay um, connected and, and competitive and uh, be equipped to uh, g go into the job force. Um, and that's a significant issue um, that a lot of children are facing here in the United States. And then we're also doing a feature documentary about NASA, um, looking at what NASA is doing now, um, uh, primarily the work they're doing both in, in you know, their efforts to get to Mars, to find out if there's life in the universe, which by the way, they feel like there's absolutely life in the universe is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and they also are doing most of the research on climate change. And so we're also looking at their kind of earth science efforts and what they're uncovering um, uh, that relates to climate change, which I know everybody here in Florida, we were flying in and I was like, <laughs> I mean, it's, you're very surrounded by water that is very close <laughs> to your houses. Um, and, you know, that's rising. And so uh, I'm sure you all are very invested and you're all very important voters. So I would consider that when you're voting. Um, but yes. Well, Rory, thank you for your extraordinary career, your work that opens our, our eyes and our hearts to those around us, and thank you for your for making Sarasota your festival home away from well, home. Thank we you. Love and it. I do want to say Sundance Schmundance, Sarasota is where it's at. <laughs> <laughs> and Charles, you got that? Alyssa oh, Barbara. Here, here. Oh, thank you, here, Barbara. Here. Right here, back here. at you, Barbara. And I also want to make a toast to Mark Familio for hosting us, for making this festival what it is, <laughs> for bringing, making you all come here today to <laughs> listen to me. Um, he's a great friend of ours, and we love you, and we appreciate everything you do, because our films without our audiences and people watching them and engaging and participating don't mean anything. So we so appreciate everybody coming out and being so supportive. And we are hoping that this film will have a theatrical release and so I hope you'll say nice things about it <laughs> and encourage people to go see it in the theaters when that opportunity arises. So thank you all, thank you Mark. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you.